we work for Joint, uh, which uh, as we were just told, uh, we build infrastructure and data center software. Uh, we've been container native since 2006. Uh, we, we operate a public cloud with global data centers and the software that powers our cloud is open source so that you can run your private data center using the same software that we're, we're running in our public cloud. And that's important because, uh, and it's important for me to tell you that because of what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, I'm also gonna take this opportunity to point out that we were just recently acquired by Samsung and uh, we're gonna be building uh, new data centers and one of the largest Docker installations in the world. So if that sort of thing is interesting to you, we're hiring. Okay, let's take a step back a little bit away from Prometheus per se and kind of get like one level up from that, right? So, so with the rise of containers and this like model that we call microservices, um, suddenly we were finding that everybody is building distributed systems, right? The complexity of what we're trying to monitor has gone up a lot. Uh, and these distributed systems are harder to observe and to debug than anything that we built, say, just 10 years ago when uh, Joint CTO was saying things like this. So, and what's more, a lot of the problems that we're facing are actually originating upstack from where we're monitoring, right? So like we get monitoring and alerts on like CPU percentage, or, which is not actually the cause, right? It's the symptom that we're seeing. And the cause is somewhere upstack. It's, it's, it's in our, um, in this really large pile of abstractions that we have. So our language runtimes, our standard libraries, the, uh, the application VM, the application framework, uh, and of course, our, the crappy application code we all write. So, and because of these problems are, because these uh, systems are distributed, many of the most difficult problems to solve, we're only ever going to see in production, uh, which means we need to be able to debug our production environments, not just what's happening on my laptop. Um, and so to debug in production means debugging safely, right? So we can't, if we, if we, uh, if our systems crash when we debug them, that doesn't work, right? That now we can't, we, we'll, we will be afraid to debug in production. Uh, also, if observing the system changes its behavior, um, which, you know, kind of in a Hegelian sort of sense, uh, or causes it to crash, uh, then we can't use it to accurately solve performance problems, right? So that means that observability is really the key to what mean, that, that's like the key element to what makes something production ready. And so and we joint think that's kind of important. And we have world-class observability tooling uh, like Dtrace and MDB, and we've built new tooling uh, like our logging analysis system called Thoth uh, to give us what we think is the best observability into what happens in our public cloud and for our customers to have that same level of observability in their private cloud installations. So I wanna, so before we can kind of get into container monitoring, which is, which is what Richard's been working on lately, uh, I kind of want to give you a high level overview of what the architecture that we're talking about is. So this is, the, this is our, our Triton architecture. Um, so on Triton, customer applications are running as containers, and those are going to be either uh, smart OS infrastructure containers or Docker, uh, Docker containers, and those containers are all running as Solaris zones. So unlike, say, the, container, uh, the containers on Linux, uh, Solaris zones have a decades-long battle-tested isolation uh, for multi-tenant security. Um, we also get bare metal performance on that, so there's no, v there's no underlying VM, and that isolation gives us the ability to have observability from outside without interfering with it. So now, of course, you know, we've been running a public cloud for a while, right? So, and we're here to talk about something that Richard's been working on today, um, and it actually is not in production, but of course there's an existing version, and we call that cloud analytics. Um, and, but it's not perfect, right? We, we, and so here's some of the, the constraints that we're trying to work under here. So, in this system, getting historical data out of it is a little bit cumbersome, mostly just because of the way the API works. Um, the API is also awkward to work with, with for highly dimensional uh, data. Um, and we wanna improve uh, our story around scalability and our, scalability, our, our story around availability. We think it's good, we think it can be better. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a subtle thing, um, and this is where we think that we can differentiate from some of our competitors, is that right now there's no real path to have uh, end user application metrics being fed into the same system that uh, they would use to do the observations of their, of their, um, of the container runtime, right? So, so if you're on, say, you know, the leading cloud provider and you're, you're using their metric system right now, like you get a sample set of, of things that they've given you, but there's no way to tie that together with your application metrics necessarily. All right, I'm gonna hand that off to Richard. Sweet. All right, uh, so when kind of attacking the things that Tim was pointing out, uh, we, we came up with some, some pretty good constraints as to, to what we had to work with. Um, obviously it has to be multi-tenant or a cloud. Um, we can't let 
consumers of this thing take down the cloud because that it kills all the other people, right? Um, and, and then we need to give people a way to like move off of what we've given them in the past with cloud analytics or move off of whatever they're running on their own or, or perhaps just integrate our stuff with theirs. Um, and, and this kind of feeds into one of the greatest things is that we're building this for rainy day operation. This is not sunny day operation. Uh, what I mean by that is most of your server monitoring tools live in your server itself. If your server is out of file descriptors or completely overloaded in, for, by some means, um, you, you can't get the data from it anymore. You don't know if it's down because the network is down or if your container is down or what. Uh, because ours operates on the principle of rainy day, we live in a global zone, which is somewhat unique to Joint. Um, and, and allows us to actually tell you the difference. Is it down or is it just completely you know, out of capacity? Um, so why pull? Well, honestly, there's a lot of really important reasons, but one of the biggest ones is, is kind of a cap problem. Um, for a public cloud, if we're pushing to our customers, we've got to know, are you down? Are you overloaded? We got to be able to back off. We got to do all kinds of different things and, and perhaps even keep a lot of state or buffer data so that you don't lose it because we had a problem or whatever else. If, if you're pulling data from us, it's up to you. And you have to manage your, your availability, your path to us, and you can know whether you're up or down, all of that. It's, it's just not tenable, at least from our perspective, to try and juggle all the balls in the air of, of pushing. Um, and then end users can have multiple consumers, right? We don't have to deal with multiple push streams. We can have a single um, agent availability for multiple people to use. Um, so why did we choose Prometheus? Kind of based on everything I just said. Um, it's, it's pretty opinionated about being pull-based. Um, it, it doesn't have, you know, desires to be a giant database, at least it doesn't sound like. Um, and so people can take from it and put it where they want. Um, we can implement their protocol, the protocol and be an agent, but not actually have to support it ourselves. Like, you can run your own Prometheus server and talk to us, and, and that kind of makes a nice demarcation point. Um, and then it's an open standard. People can build on top of that. All right, so architecture of this whole thing. Uh, starts with the metric agent. So there's one of these on every compute node in our cloud. Uh, it actually lives in what I said is the global zone, which kind of has the God view of everything that's going on. Uh, it's an advantage of, of doing OS virtualization instead of hardware virtualization. Um, and it collects the metrics from the already built-in uh, metrics in the kernel um, and file system uh, for smart OS, uh, which is KStat and ZFS. Um, so it's actually really nice because we don't have to do a bunch of hard calculation in the agent that feeds them. We kind of just move it out of the OS and the OS is doing the real hard work for keeping all that state. Um, so this is actually somewhat misleading. Uh, the hypervisor and the metric agent are in the same place, but kind of the, the that you get the gist. Uh, there's lots of customers on one box and an agent itself that lives um, there. Um, what the agent's actually doing is kind of approximating a node exporter. So it takes the OS stats, like you would think like a server monitor from New Relic or something. It takes the, the OS level stats and pushes them up. Obviously we can't have um, customers hitting our admin network in the global zone of each compute node, so there's more to it than that. <coughs> right? So. Every data center has many of these metric agents. Um, every CN gets its own um, metric agent. And so the all important metric agent proxy comes in. Um, this, is, this is where customers talk to our Prometheus output. Um, essentially, we proxy your server's request in and pretend as if we are one individual node exporter. Um, so you, we'll get into exactly how in a second. Um, this is HA across every data center availability zone that we have. Um, you have one on a head node and then two on some others. Um, since it's stateless and just basically proxying requests and doing auth, uh, it's pretty easy to scale out both for redundancy and for, for request rate. Um, 
and so it's a great choke point as well for rate limiting um, and making sure you are who you say you are. So how do we pretend, how do we act as if we are one node exporter? Um, kind of we build on something that a, a colleague and I built a little while ago uh, called Triton CNS, uh, which is a container naming service, which will automatically give you an A record based on some criteria um, for all of the VMs that you spin up in our cloud. Um, that's more detail that we need to get into here, but essentially we're leveraging that so that every time you spin up a VM, we'll actually create a C name to the metric proxy. So you'd have like your VM UUID dot container monitor dot triton dot zone or something like that. Um, and you'd hit that slash metrics. Um, but that's kind of obtuse, right? But we'll, we'll, we'll get around that in a minute. Um, right. So that ends up kind of looking like that. One or more metric proxies at the edge. It knows which metric agent is where, so it knows your, where your VM is at. So if you're looking for, you know, VM dead beef, uh, you're gonna. It knows. Oh, that's on CN1. It'll reach out and reconstruct that request to CN1 uh, in a slightly different format, which I can show you in a little while. Um, but it still maintains the Prometheus text format and slash metrics um, route. Um, right, so metric collection is either going to happen with your Prometheus server, wherever you put that, um, or if you're not using Prometheus and you want to push it somewhere else, you can spin up a forwarder, essentially some app that we or you have written which speaks to Prometheus server and then shuttles it on to, to I don't know, fill in the blank um, metric system which you might already have, graphite or whatever. So that's kind of how that looks. Um, and then when you add in the metric forwarder, similar idea. Um, it's just pretending to be a Prometheus server and shuttling it out in a different format. Um, so I've already kind of talked about this a little bit, but when you launch a container, uh, our VM API, so we have a bunch of microservices that run all the different parts of our cloud. So VM API pushes a change feed event. Change feed is another um, system that I built, uh, which essentially is a way of doing message bus without state having to do a time series delivery. Um, so it pushes that change feed to CNS. CNS picks that up, creates the C name, and now all of a sudden you can query metric agent proxy as if it were a node exporter that you had access to. Um, <clears throat> kind of already touched on that, so. Yeah. Cool. All right, so we were talking about, what I was talking about earlier that we wanted to give uh, our customers an ability to say, well, what, let's use the same system for application metrics that we want to have for the, you know, the container metrics. Um, and so uh, I've been working at, at Joint on a project called the Autopilot Pattern, and it's a design pattern for having applications be self-operating and self-managing. Um, it's kind of the opposite of the Kubernetes approach or the Mesos approach, where instead of saying like, we're gonna put all the intelligence for how an application wires itself up in some kind of mega orchestration framework, you actually push it down into the application level and let applications be self-assembling. So uh, they have enough intelligence to say, well, what are my dependencies and how do I find them and what do I need to do when things change? Um, there's a, the, the problem with that, the only problem with that model is of course that not all applications are capable of doing that and sometimes you need a little bit of help. And so uh, I've worked on a project called Container Pilot uh, that is a micro orchestrator, so to speak, uh, that lives inside the container. And so it is a, it acts as PID1, it acts as the init system within the container. It launches your application and then fires off a bunch of lifecycle hooks. Um, why that's interesting for this talk is that one of those hooks is telemetry sensors. So as part of the, as part of the con con container pilot configuration for your application, you can s give it a set of arbitrary sensors that live inside the container, and those containers will be fed to a Prometheus, scrap uh, a Pr Prometheus scrapable endpoint that container pilot serves. So because those containers have a, a CNS name, uh, and because Container Pilot exposes that Prometheus endpoint, 
uh, we can add, it, as part of our discovery catalog, we can add that, and, and sorry, and they're all registering themselves with the discovery catalog, um, so for example, con console or CD. The, in addition to your Prometheus server using the Triton Discovery plugin that we were that uh, Richard was just pointing out, uh, you can also have it scrape your console uh, discover discovery catalog, and now you have both a source for application metrics and for uh, the container metrics. So I want to take a look at like what a container pilot configuration looks like for something like that. So this is this is an nginx container. Um, and if I kind of dive into this, so at the top of this, this is how we define services in, in Container Pilot. So the idea here is that we say uh, we're talking to the console uh, discovery catalog at that, uh, that URL. We have a pre-start lifecycle hook, so like what do we do before we start? Um, uh, a service block here, which is um, I'm, I'm going to advertise the Nginx service into console, and then this is how I'm going to health check it and how long the, the heartbeats will last, things like that. And then what backends this thing, this particular application is interested in. This, in this case, we just have an example uh, app. And then what it's going to do when that changes. Um, if you want to see more of that, I, I'd be happy to demo for anybody afterwards, but it's not really interesting to the monitoring topic. So if we keep going down a little bit, so this is where the telemetry is assigned, is, is uh, configured, right? So we have two different sensors here, and you see that these are, these are basically Prometheus configurations, right? So we've got uh, the name for that and the, the help string, and that's what will be in the text format. Uh, these are two different gauge uh, metrics, and we see how those are generated, right? So there's a sensor, and, and these sensors can be arbitrarily rich, right? This is just a bash script, right? But they could be a C program. It could be some kind of metric that is a particular to your application. And the really important part here is that the, met is that the sensor, along with all its other behaviors, actually ships inside the container, right? So your container is completely self-contained. Um, rather than having it be the responsibility of some th third party uh, to figure out how to, send, how to measure your particular application. So let's do a little demo here. Uh, I'm going to switch off my mirroring. So what I've got here is, um, in this terminal, can everybody see that? Yeah, all right. I've got a, um, we're just gonna do Docker Compose up. So this is running against, um, I've got a SSL warning on that. So this is running against uh, a local version of Triton that's running on our laptop, and I don't have my search set up properly. So Python and Compose is giving me a hassle. Uh, so what this is doing is this is going and launching, and we can kind of see here, it's launching uh, a series of containers. So it, uh, and these are all defined by this Docker Compose file that's here. So I've got console, I've got Nginx, and I've got uh, an example backend application. So as these come up, they're going to start seeing them. I've got example, okay, so that should be up. So what I'm gonna do he over here on this side is I'm gonna ask the Triton uh, API on this laptop uh, for the IP of that node. Copy that into browser here. All right, so this is the console configuration. Uh, this is the, con I'm sorry, this is the console UI. So as these other containers come up, they're gonna be registering themselves. Um, and so the example one has come up first. And you'll see here that it also has container pilot, right? So it's advertising itself as a service, but because it has sensors, it's also advertising a container pilot service to console. So as these containers come up, they'll all have IPs for a container pilot uh, uh, service. So I've, got, I've now got Nginx and my example container, so I should be able to, uh, right, so I'm gonna uh, just hit my Nginx example, and so this is just like a, this Nginx is just proxying to a Node.js application that does like fortune cookies, right? Like very, very simple um, self-assembling application here. Um, and that also means that I have Prometheus metrics for that application. So each of my containers will advertise this Prometheus endpoint, 
and now my Prometheus uh, server will be able to use uh, con will be able to use the console discovery plugin to find those uh, to find those nodes at, at those IPs. If I come here now, we'll see that I have that container pilot IP, and and that console uh, my Prometheus server will be able to use that IP to reach uh, to reach that metrics endpoint. Right, I'm hand it off to cool. All right, so kind of as a side effect of, of what we just spun up there, um, we should see some, some new targets in here. And what I've got is the user that we used to spin up all of Tim's demo um, has a Prometheus server on the same cloud that automatically picked up these three um, containers that Tim showed you in console um, via the Triton Discovery plugin, which look for our pull request on that in the near future. Um, and so I, I can't hit these because the DNS on my laptop is different than the DNS in the fake cloud. What I can show you is that also the, the agents and the VMs that are running in our cloud themselves are being, are being monitored. Um, so this is actually um, CN API, the compute node uh, API, and its metrics. So this is the same thing being fed for all of our stuff that customers um, containers would see as well, which is what you're going to see here. Um, if I wanted to... Uh, be a little tricky. I could actually break this down because I've, I've got access to all the networks since this is a fake cloud. Um, and I could just take this over here and do that. And we should get the metrics for one of Tim's zones. Um, that's kind of showing you two things. Uh, what you see here is actually the metric agent view of the world. So it has its own admin accessible only IP. You feed it the VMU UID that you care about, well, metric, metric proxy does, um, and slash metrics, and it goes goes ahead and returns back that data. Um, the IP or the the URIs you see here are actually the ones that we would expose publicly. So that's what you, as if you were using our cloud or private cloud or whatever, that's what you'd actually hit. So that's kind of the translation that happens from that URI right there down to this one, and then the round trip back. Um, I think right. that's what we got. Thanks a lot, folks. So, questions? You describe the container environment that you provide a safe contained versus an outside approach that Kubernetes is using. I don't understand where the differences are because to me it seemed like I could do very much inside the container or very much the same that you do showed just now in Kubernetes as well. Um, <clears throat> I think what you're mentioning is where I talk about the metric agent being able to live on the compute node itself. Is, is that what you're referencing? Probably. Okay. <laughs> Um, so what I'm talking about is that since we do uh, OS level virtualization, we can have one agent that sits on each CN and looks in. I imagine you could do that with, with Kubernetes if you're running it on bare metal. Um, if you're running Kubernetes on a hypervisor and like the traditional like AWS style stuff, that actually gets hard to get those metrics because your hypervisor is a lie. Um, because it, it could go down and not your, your VM that Kubernetes is running in, right? Like you're still hoping that the underlying machine and hypervisor that's running that um, is around. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. If you're running Kubernetes or Docker on bare metal, security implications of such things aside, you could probably get away with this. Thanks. Well, that looks to be it. Thank you very much. <laughs>